a quick question. Just ask the first question about so much you've studied up on JavaScript for reading on JavaScript. That's what we're going to talk about today. Just the first question, we'll answer the rest of the questions in a little bit. Oh, yeah, try to answer the first question. Let me know the readings going on JavaScript. And while we're waiting for people to sign in, quick stuff. Who can tell me what JIT stands for? Just, 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 just in time. Just in time. That's right. So we have just in time compilers and we have just in time study habits, that sort of stuff. For example, how many of you, when you take a multiple choice quiz on reading, Usually have the reading open but not read beforehand. You look for the first question, you scan, you find, oh, there's the answer, and then you put it in. Anyone ever done that? Yeah, just in time turning type. So there are a lot of advantages to just in time. I think we all get we all get um, we all get our brain, you know, the pheromones, things feel good, we get Adrenaline because just in time works and it saves us a lot of time, and we usually are only quiz on answers. And this is a fault of the education system because testing does not measure act, not measure very well what you've learned. You know what we do when as a professor teacher we create a test? We there's a space of learning, so this big blob of learning that you're supposed to learn all that stuff in. And we randomly take dots throughout this space. And if you happen to hit those dots, it looks like you've learned well. And if you happen to miss those dots, not so good on the test, right? And so we have to approximate learning. Just like, um, so looking here at these numbers, it looks like, let me bring this up. Let's see how that works. Um, it looks like. A number of us are employing the just-in-time learning strategy on the reading. Um, that blue is not the all done. That's not really done much on the testing. The uh, all done plus I've been looking at some more stuff is this <laughs> right there. Um, there is some of you who did it. It's not enough if it actually puts a number on there. That's too bad. But. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about JavaScript and jQuery and Ajax. There will be a lot of interesting things they do, but for the most part, we are going to concentrate on a few important things. How we find stuff inside a web page, how we manipulate stuff in a web page, and how we get information back and forth from web page to the server. So those will be the big highlights for today. So let's go and talk about this. Okay, so jQuery manipulates what's called the DOM, which is the object model inside the browser. So everything, when you say I have a paragraph, when you say I have a header, when you have a footer, when you have a div, all those are just objects inside of the DOM, and you have to go and find and manipulate them. Now, if you're writing your own data structure, that had to randomly search through a big space to find stuff and manipulate it, what kind of data structure would you use? Browser. 
graph could well be a graph yeah um, in fact you can sort of say like here is the HTML node and under it is the body node and the head node and under those yeah a tree or a graph probably a tree but a good idea but searching that is problematic because if I want to search for a paragraph how am I going to find it? I'll have to search every single node in this graph. So it turns out a tree is not a great, it's there by the way, there's a tree, but it's not a great way to have to find stuff in the page. So what else should we have? IDs. IDs, yeah, well, but how do you find an ID? I mean, you search the entire tree, but yeah, you hash it. So there's a hash table with a DOM. And what makes web programming really interesting to me, if I was creating my own big data structure, I would have a way to get to different parts of it that I would understand. But in web programming, you just throw it all away and you just assume there's a hash table. And anything you need, you just say, jQuery, go find it for me. And it looks in this DOM and finds that thing for you. And that takes time because it's got to build all those data structures. But do we care? Do we care that it takes time to find these things? We say no. Why? Our computers are fast enough. Yeah, our computers are fast enough. Web pages are small enough. It doesn't matter. In fact, so I could lie and say they really don't have hash tables because it's a linear search, and you still wouldn't notice because web page is not big enough that a linear search would take enough time. So uh, it's pretty a, a neat idea here that with jQuery, all we do is anything you want to find in our web page, we just search for it, and we assume jQuery is fast enough and it's not going to cause the problem. So uh, jQuery is built in JavaScript. It's all written in JavaScript. Everything you do in jQuery, you can do in JavaScript. You just, it's easier in jQuery. Okay. All right, so we went over a number of these things before. And we came to here where jQuery allows us to find things in our document. So if I want to edit the title, I would use this selection notation here where I would say, go find the ID. So it said ID, yeah, ID is important. Go find the ID of the title, and then I can do something to it. Um, likewise, I can apply functions to my code. Now, one of the interesting things, I was going to show JS Fiddle today, but when I try to go to JS Fiddle, someone trying to go to JS Fiddle right now. When I tried to go to JS Fiddle today, it was not working from the use network. So I don't know if that was you or not. But I've said this before, but let's say it one more time. When I send a web page from the server to your clients, what order does that web page arrive in? But those of you who have taken networking know that the entire web page cannot just magically appear in one chunk. Some part of the web page has to come first. So you first send a sheet to headers, which determines the position of the page, which content type it is, and whatnot, and then the page itself, the content comes after the header. Okay, so there are these header things, and we'll look at some of those today. And then there's content, but is it the end content come first, the first? Well, I mean, it's, maybe it's, maybe you just assume, and you're right, that it's one after another. It's top down. That's right. So sometimes you will take an action in JavaScript that occurs at the top of your website. Well, as the parser in the browser is reading it, you will take those actions. Which is really interesting because if those actions say change things down here, those things aren't there yet, right? It's still loading. So it says change these things and nothing happens because the web page isn't in memory in the browser. So somehow you need to tell the browser to wait until everything is there before you go. And so in the JavaScript, you use this. Add event listener, DOM content loaded, and then you give it a function that you want and then I don't even know what that call is. But that says wait until the entire web page is there and then execute this function, which can do its job. In jQuery, all of that is replaced with dollar and there's a function. So it just makes it easier, quicker to use. As I think I said last time, dollar is a shortcut for jQuery. You could, in fact, just say jQuery.save rather than uh, dollar. These are selectors. Let's look at them real quickly. It's got a period and then a name. Any suggestions or thoughts or guesses what a period and a name is selecting for inside of a document? Yes. Like the name of the ID. So like the period says what it's looking for and then the name is 
Okay, so the answer was that the period says go look for the ID that is saved. By the way, how many IDs saved would be in one document? One. Now, if you have bad HTML, you can have many of them, but in theory, only one ID. So, it turns out though that the dot is not for IDs. There is a symbol for IDs. Does anyone remember through the reading what the symbol for IDs is? Octothorpe, that's right. Octothorpe is for IDs. So then that means the dot is for something else. What is the other thing that's probably interesting to look for? Classes, right. So the dot is for classes, the octothorpe is for IDs. And you don't need a dot. So let's say we got rid of the dot altogether. We don't have an octothorpe, we don't have a dot. What would this be looking for? Turns out this would be looking for elements. So if there was an angle saved element. Um, as far as I know, there is no saved element in HTML, but you could put an h1 here or div here. Now one of the neat things about jQuery is that it realizes that there are going to be multiple items inside. So how many elements inside a single web page could have the saved class associated with it? Zero, one, or almost infinite. I won't say infinite because it's never a complete load, right? Okay, so lots of them, which is neat because then jQuery will return either a singleton or an array. And what's even neater is if you apply a function to the return value, it will apply that function to every single one of the return values. So if I want to change every um, paragraph inside my document to have a red font. I would say jQuery quote P, and then I would use the jQuery command to change the color to or the styling to that. So we've already been talking about selection. Here's an example: find all the divs, find all the saved classes, and once you find them, you can do stuff with them. So here's a neat one. Turns out, of course, that body is an element inside the page. And one thing you might want to do is as you are writing your code, you want to debug your code, right? And I gave you two examples last time of how to debug code in JavaScript. Does anyone remember what those debug things are? There's some whispers down here. Anyone in the back remember what this? Okay, what were you whispering? Console.log. Yeah, console.log, you'll print it in that console, and if you're in if you're inside the inspector in Chrome, for example, you would see all your messages just like debug messages. So that was one way. There's another way if you talk about alert. Alert. You put the alert JavaScript and it'll pop up a message at the top of your screen, it won't let you go until you hit OK on that alert. Both of these are fairly intrusive. Um, one requires that you get the debugger running, one requires that you stop and look at the alert. You might want to do something a little less intrusive. For example, this, you could just append to the bottom of the body whatever the message is that you want. So as you're testing jQuery out, you could just append at the bottom, you see these messages like change text to red, move this item, did that, did this. So that's a, you know, you don't often do this, but sometimes you do update the page using jQuery. Um, other things that we will see in jQuery is it expects a lot of anonymous functions. How many of you like anonymous functions? Yes. No one? Who doesn't like anonymous functions? Why don't you like anonymous functions? What's that? Yeah, they're hard to read. Until you get used to the notation, there's, there's this little chunk of code stuck there that it doesn't have a name. Names to me are really important. Like names tell me what functions do. It doesn't have a name, you have to read the code, there are no comments, it's in line. There are a lot of bad things about anonymous functions. But they're time savers and they allow us as programmers to quickly throw stuff in there because we don't care who reads our code after we quit our job. So they do have a lot of functionality. Now there are some good points. Who was a, a champion of anonymous? Why are you a champion of anonymous? Uh, just convenience. Yeah. Very convenient. So if I want to just put a message here that says hi to the user, 
you know, I don't need a real function to do that. I don't need comments on it. I can just quickly throw it in. And in C sharp, like they figured that even typing out the word function is too much, right? They just had the parentheses, and that was good enough to make an anonymous function. But so it's everywhere. C sharp has it, JavaScript has it, et cetera. Okay. Um, we're going to see more anonymous functions. I'll use them all over the place. But uh, before we do, remind me what does the dollar parentheses do for me? It's it's jQuery, and what is just putting parentheses around a function do? So I give you two ideas, and these are the two things you use jQuery for most. One is wait till the page loads and do something. Two is find something in the web page. So is this wait for the page to load and then say hi, or is it find a function in the web page? It is wait until the page loads. Hmm. How do you know that? Because it doesn't have a string right here. Let's back up one step. See the string at the top? Dollar string means find something, dollar function means wait the page loads. Now, we're talking about the convenience. This is super convenient. But if you've never seen it before, it's also super confusing, right? So uh, this is the difference between once you're an expert in something, you want it to be super concise and a tight and short thing. Until then, it becomes hard to read. Uh, you don't have to use anonymous functions. You can write your function, you put comments on them, you can have them well set up, and then you can just throw the function in here. It just works fine. But you'll find as you read examples in the web, most people don't use this notation. They just want to throw their short functions directly into the code. Um, Finally, also notice that we don't put parentheses here, because if we put parentheses, what would happen? What happens when you put parentheses anywhere? Well, not anywhere, but in your code. Right, does the thing inside parentheses first. So if you had parentheses right after do it, it would run the do it function. And then the do it function did what? Return a function. Isn't that a great function to return functions? And then after the page loads, it could call our function. But that's not what we're doing. So don't put parentheses there unless you really want to do it. Okay, so there's the summary. Dollar function loads after it's, everything is done. And did you get a chance to put it off? Anyone? It did come off for you. Okay, so let's me try and see if I can get this to finish it. All right, it did come back. Okay, so one of the neat things here is you'll see that here's the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript that we want to do, and the default is no libraries, pure JavaScript, and here's the result. If I left click on this, we can see that we can choose things like no library. For the most part, we will choose, if we're playing with it, to use jQuery. So we'll just choose the most recent jQuery. And now we're good to go. Um, so now up here in the JavaScript, I can say dollar ID dot, and then we want to do something to it. Uh, what would we want to do to our ID? Well, let's get an ID first. Uh, H1 ID equals title. Doom was here. Save this and run. Doom was here. Now we want to run our JavaScript jQuery. We can do something to the title. For example, we can change the CSS. How do you change the color in CSS? Is it just color red, something like that? How does that work? jQuery. Oh, I, sorry, I was, I always get my error that I made to show you why it didn't work. I've forgotten that I made that error. Yes, can someone tell us why this is not working? Go ahead, someone had the right answer. Can you turn up the house time on ID? Right, this says look for an element called ID, so this would work if I had an element ID hello, because that's an element ID. So 
but we didn't mean that. We wanted the ID attribute uh, uh, tag. Okay, so now when I run it's not going to work. Why is that? Because it's not title. Because it's not ID, it is title. There we go. So then finally, once we get all this working, then we have to decide if we have our CSS right. And there's where you'll have to do a lot of Googling, like jQuery change color. Okay, change the text color to jQuery. And the first thing it says is CSS, and it wants a JSON object just like in the CSS file with the curly braces. So we are going to go back to our fiddle. Or we could do two parameters. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Color red. Let's just grab this since I make you use braces. How do you think? And then we run it, and then it gets stuck. Okay, so. Here we have the selector. It says search through our entire document for the thing we want to do something to. Then, in this case, change the CSS for it and apply a red color to the text. If you've played a lot with the ASP core stuff already, you've seen that happen somewhere. Where, have you, where might you have seen something like this? No one's seen any red stuff pop up. Access denied? The access denied is a red color. That's not this one. Okay. No one's tried to create a user and type the wrong password or a password that doesn't have an exclamation mark or something in it, and it, it pops something up. That is probably using jQuery to modify the page to show something that wasn't shown and to make the colors different. Okay? So, all right. I also wanted to mention this load thing. So as I said before, when a website starts, it reads from the top to the bottom. So the question then is, why is this code working? And the answer must be that the JavaScript is after the HTML on the web page. So when you design a web page, does the JavaScript always come after the HTML, or does it matter? It can be anywhere, that's right. So if we look, where are the options? The settings. Oh, sorry, right here. Notice it was off the screen when I was too small. When I'm choosing the language and choosing the library, then I have this load type. And the load type gives me Three options. One is on load, which is the general one. You mostly want your JavaScript to, look, to execute after the page has been loaded. Two, on DOM ready, similar. No wrap, the bottom of head. So head is at the top of our document, and then the JavaScript goes under it, and then everything. And then no wrap, bottom of body. So we have the head, the body, and then our JavaScript goes underneath everything on our page. Make sense? Okay, so if we change this to put it at the bottom, the JavaScript at the, sorry, at the top of our body, so before the HTML, and we run our program, it doesn't work because the JavaScript tried to execute, see that makes it bigger again. The JavaScript tried to execute this, but the ID did not exist because this JavaScript was above here. If, on the other hand, we change our no wrap to the bottom of the body, so afterwards, and then we rerun our program, it will take effect. So I, I just take, you know, three or four minutes to say that because a lot of times I've seen students, as they're developing their code, they'll put their JavaScript in the wrong place, or they'll forget to put the dollar parentheses around it, and no matter how much code they have to write, it won't do anything, and they'll spend a long time fighting that. So if you find that your code looks perfectly fine, make sure that it's being executed. And of course, one way to do that is to use the debugger, which someone mentioned earlier.
Okay, so here we are. What's that view again? On page loads, do this function in the page loads. That's right. Read the body loads. Um, this, what does this do? If we put the script, that's the same. If I put the script at the bottom of my HTML, that's the same as on page load. Uh, here are the different versions debugging. We use debugger, console log alert, etc. So, most important things, and as we get our code up and running, we're going to start playing with some more of these selection things. Selection is number one. Number two is manipulation, where we change our page dynamically. And then number three, which could be the most important on some of our pages, but won't be on all our pages, is Ajax, where we call and use JavaScript to talk to our web server. So let's talk about Ajax. <coughs> so Ajax stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. It's pretty cool. How many of you use XML? A little bit. What do you use it? What do you use XML for? Come on over there. Android front end. Ah, the Android front end definitions. That's right. XML at some point was taking over the world uh, because for those of you who don't know, XML is just a way like HTML to define uh, tag data. Uh, it was taking over the world, and then people came up with something they thought was better. Does anyone know what that is? It's JSON. JSON, which is JavaScript. So they said, hey, that XML stuff is cool, but we're writing in Java. Let's just put everything in JavaScript to define objects. And so it really should be a, what was it? A just a song. A just a song. A J song? Something like that. I don't know. But Ajax stuff. Even though we don't use XML, we use JSON for most of our work. So let's talk about how we could get away without Ajax. One of the main ways is using forms. And you've already got forms when you do your registration, when you log in, when you create learning outcomes. Those are all forms. And they all have something like action, which says where in the server to go, what the URL is, and method, host, or get. So those are two ways to get data from the front end client to the back end server. Okay. Now, and it works most of the time. These actions are great, but almost always when you post a form, what happens? So when I register for a user, what happens after I hit register? It redirects to a new web page. When I log in, it redirects to a new web page. When I create a learning outcome and save it, it redirects to a new web page. And that is the traditional way that the web was set up. Every action redirects to a new web page. But the modern web is all about modifying a web page in place when it makes sense to do so. So we can still use the form methods, but we can use them in Ajax. Uh, before I do that, I want to talk about Git and post. So as was said earlier, when you are sending information to the server, you give it some attributes. And two of those attributes you can give is, hey server, I am getting information from you, or hey server, I am posting information to you. And in the early days of the web, this sort of made sense. And Git said, give me something back, and post said, here's some information for you. But nowadays, those two items are used almost interchangeably. We almost, in fact, we almost always use post. Git is of limited value. Now, it's sort of interesting, when I send information, send a request to the server with a Git, all of that information is encoded in the URL. So you say, go to jim.com slash A equals apple, B equals banana, and you put all that information right there in the URL. And that means that anybody who's looking at your URLs can see whatever information you've posted, which may or may not be problematic. Sorry, all the information you've gitted. Isn't that weird because I say gitted? Because you have to send information with a git request. When you request stuff with your git, you have to send information. And we'll see that in a little bit. Post hides that data in the body of the application. And there's a few other things that go on there as well. For example, since you put the get information in the URL, how long a URL can you have? Any guesses? Infinite URLs? 
There is a limit. Yeah, it turns out URLs can only be about 2,000 bytes long. And so if you want to have a lot of information transferred, you can't even use a git. You have to use a post. OK, um, so here's the example that we're going to play with and is actually going to be part of your homework or similar to your homework is what if we wanted the instructor in our Compasso University to be able to put notes next to each student's name? How would we go about doing that? Actually, it seems very reasonable. The instructor is teaching, the student comes and talks to them, they want to put a note, they just scribble it down on the web page next to the student. So that is what we're going to concentrate on today. Turns out it's not that complex. If everything goes well, you could easily get this money in an hour. First, we have to create a database table in the model, but we've all seen how to do that before. Um, we have to add UI to the course page, but I'll show you that UI is pretty, pretty straightforward. And then we have to add a button that allows us to click on it and says save a note to the web page. So we don't have to do a lot of things. On a web page, we don't have to send that information, we'll use Ajax. So here is the syntax for Ajax. And I'll put it up here. You'll probably just cut and paste it off of the web, but you can use this. So dollar means jQuery.ajax. Ajax is a function of jQuery library. And then curly braces, and we put the parameters of our Ajax request here. And when our JavaScript executes, this will fire off a message to the server. So very straightforward. Well, just like in a post, Sorry, in a form. You see that form? We had the action and the method. We need the same sort of stuff with our Ajax. So we take our basic Ajax query with parameters, and two of the parameters would be the URL we want to go to, so the path to the controller, and then the method would either be get or post. When we run this, probably the first time you do it, something's going to go wrong. And you're going to get a message that pops up something like this saying, hey, there's a 500 error. I don't know what's going on. So we'll talk about ways you can cause this. Usually it's your parameters are incorrect or your routes are incorrect. But one of the neat things you can do is you click on this in the Chrome Inspector, and up will come the networking panel. And this networking panel, uh, so the debug panel, which has a networking tab in it, which is the network tab. And this networking tab is just filled with all sorts of useful information that if we get lucky and our code just works the first time, we never go and look at. But the things that are really interesting, it will show you the elements that came across. Now, I've just got this one web page. It turns out anytime you load a web page, there's almost never just one thing here. Usually there's CSS files that have to be downloaded, there's JavaScript files that have to be downloaded, there's images that are downloaded, there's usually tons of things. But here, we just have this very simple example. We click on change note, and all this interesting stuff comes up. The most important things we want are the response, which is that actual HTML that came back, because often that will tell us what went wrong. Cookies, which we will talk about more in the future, and headers, which are these pieces of information that go back and forth between the server and the client to say what's going on. Uh, by the way, cookies, I just as I was looking through these, I saw this cookie that was pretty neat. ASP.NET Core Identity Application Cookie. So again, we're going to talk about cookies a lot in the future, but a cookie is a piece of information that's constantly going back and forth between your laptop and the server. What do you think is in this identity application cookie? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with identity, which we should know something about. Yeah. Your login information. Your login information. That's right. So you probably take it for granted that every time you go to a web page, you don't have to put in your login and password. You do it once, and it remembers you. Because obviously it wouldn't work if every single page, like you go to Amazon, if you want to buy this thing, put in your password, and then confirm the, the, um, the order, put in your password, and then list your order, put in the password. It just it wouldn't work. So 
this identity cookie contains your password information. That's actually a lie. It doesn't contain your password. When you log in for the very first time, we, like, so you're my server, I say, hey, I'm Jim, and we verify, we shake hands, we agree that we're together. Now you come up with a magic word. Oh, you whispered a magic word to me. <laughs> so now, every time, and you only get key, right? If you get the word from anyone else. Right. So if I know the magic word, he knows that it's me because I, he's the only, I'm the only one who got that magic word. So that cookie contains that magic word, and that's how it knows. If I go in and delete this cookie, which you can on your browser, if you can go and delete any of those cookies, and then you go to the next web page, Boop, it'll pop up and say you're not logged in and make you log in again because the magic word is gone. We'll come back to this. Um, headers. So here is an example where we're sending things off. And here was the request. I sent a post request to instructor change note using secure HTTPS. And so all of these things look good, um, except encoding. I think I've mentioned that before, but this is saying that it's okay to compress the web pages as they go back and forth because both the server and the laptop know how to uncompress them. Um, so all this interesting information you can use to verify, did you send the right request when things go wrong? Another thing that you're going to need to do to verify things going wrong and right is use the following pieces of Ajax. So here's the next piece of syntax. Done fail, and always. So you send off your request. The server either does something or doesn't, sends you an error message or sends you a success message. Done will happen if a success happens. If there are no error messages, whatever code goes into done will be executed inside of JavaScript. Now, by the way, this is asynchronous. So when I send a request to the server, how long is it going to take for it to get back to me? Nobody. <laughs> How long did it take for the server to get back to you? Deletion, delete, 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 some of us, and then get deleted. Well, How do you know it's there? How do you know? It's not as long as it needs. It takes as long as it needs, right. Now, you could put this within a reasonable cap, for example, 20 seconds, after which my impatience goes and I click to the next web page, right? So, but you don't know how long it's going to take, so you just have to wait until it gets back. Hopefully, if it's an error, it will immediately figure out it's an error and send your laptop an error message, in which case the fail function will happen. And we're going to see a lot of fails if you debug your code, and you can look at these various objects and get some information out of them about what went wrong. Now, you're not always going to get very valuable information. Sometimes, like the error, the text dash would be error. Okay. Finally, always, always is equivalent to what in programming languages? In C sharp and a try catch block, there's a finally statement. Yeah, so always is the finally statement. It will happen no matter what. Um, in a second, I'll talk a little bit about spinners. Who doesn't know what a spinner is? So when I hit load on a web page and this little thing goes round and round and round and round, that's called a spinner. Um, almost always, right there before the Ajax call, you should show your spinner. And always at the end, you should unhide your spinner. So the spinner goes as long as necessary. Now it turns out that on all the applications you'll be writing on your laptop, even if you put spinner code in, you'll never see the spinners. Sad but true. Why is that? Your laptops are too fast and our queries are too small. So like, I will get lazy when I write web stuff and I won't put spinners in, and then I will go across campus to the poorer corners where the internet's not as good and load a big web page and it won't do anything. And I won't even know that it's not doing anything because I didn't put a spinner on my web page. But if you want spinners above the Ajax, you show the spinner and here you uh, here's some examples, like if I wanted to say an action was taken, I can just throw the console log. If I wanted to put a fail message and show off 
those error messages like to do that, or I could do a custom. So you just put code inside of here to do what you want. By the way, so this is all modern. The always done and fail are what are called promises. And they mean that these things will happen once the appropriate actions take place. In the old days, the same thing was done by inside the Ajax, where you put your URL method, you would put a success and error field into your Ajax request. And these will do the same thing as the um, done and fail. So when you are looking for help on the internet, and you see success and error, you'll remember that during high school, Jim said, oh, that's the old way, and we should use done and fail. OK. Um, so programming assignment five is going out. So I want to talk about it, just so we can start doing a demo in that area. Uh, but the first thing I, I want to get some feedback from you is, like, what is spinner? We talked about it. Um, how long does it take to implement a spinner? Good question. All right, any guesses? How long do you think it takes for so one box? For one one web page to be spinner? Like five minutes. Yeah, you have to on your web page you have to have an image of a spinner. Okay, it takes you five minutes to actually probably takes you thirty minutes to go and Google spinners and go, oh that one's cool. Oh no, no, this is even better. Uh, I can't decide. 30 minutes later, you choose a spinner, which is just an image, an animated GIF or something. You show it at the top of your web page. Yeah, sorry, you put it in your web page, you hide it, and you show it before an Ajax, and you hide it. Yeah, so it should take five minutes or so. But the first time you do it, it's probably going to take you 30 minutes, maybe an hour to do it. Should you put spinners on your web page? Absolutely. Every web page that does a remote reflection should take a spinner. So, now the question becomes the following. I mean, so what does it look like? You know, you copy an image file in the HTML, you have to put this image tag, you put that above your Ajax, and then right before your uh, sorry, you put that in your web page in your Ajax call code right before you say spinner show, and at the end of the Ajax you say spinner hide. So these three lines will allow you to do spinner. Uh, and so now that I've shown it to you, hopefully it'll take you, you know, 10 or 15 or 30 minutes to do it the first time. But why do I ask this question? Why are we asking this? So I need your input on the assignment. So there are lots of things that make a website okay, and then other things that make it good. So for example, I'm going to have you write notes on courses. So if an instructor wants to give a, a note on the course, it's going to be a box where they type their note into. Okay? When you're typing notes into a web page, should you just have a plain box where you just type characters in? Probably not. In the AZA, when you type a note in, what kind of box do you type the note into? Your spinners. How many of you have typed into the AZA? You probably don't even notice, right? What is it you're typing into? Text area. There's a text area. And there is a text editor area. It has stuff like bold, it has stuff like paragraphs, and it has links, and it allows you to put images, all those things in. So, a good website will throw your little text box into a pretty text editor. Now, my question for you is, is how much is that worth doing? So I want to go to the clicker questions, and there's a number of questions, but one is about grading for the next assignment. So here's my current thought. I've identified 10 points worth of stuff on the assignment, very specific, very you know, straightforward, but it's going to take time to do. One of them is put a WYSIWYG editor around your text box. Here are three options, and we're going to take a poll of the class and go with the majority rules. Option one is we're going to have what's called gold, which is gold has no value. It's just like Reddit gold, you know, give it away to people. Um, I just say those 10 points are everybody's. Everyone gets 10 points for free. You don't have to do anything. But if you want to be good, do those things for me because good websites will happen. So that's one option. Option two is what I call weighted. So if I 
weighted the score by how much time I think it will take to implement, it would probably be about a quarter of the assignment. So like 25 points for these little things. And then the third way is weighted bang for the buck. Do you really need a fancy WYSIWYG editor to type notes into a web page? No, you don't. You don't need those. So here's our three examples. Like, can we, oh, here's another example. Let me give you some other things that I will have you do. One is when you type a note into a web page, it's really good if you timestamp that note. Because five years from now, you want to know when you wrote that note. Okay, it doesn't take that much time to write timestamp code, but it's going to take a little bit of investigating, a little bit of figuring out, saving it, etc. So, again, what's the, do you need to put a timestamp on a note? No, you don't. But is a good website going to do it? Yes. So, goal, everybody gets points, those who want to show that they can do these extra things. Waiting by expected time, I change what I currently have the values are to make them much more expensive so that the amount of time you spend gives you more points. Or weighted by expected bang for the buck, where all of these extra things are going to take a couple hours of time are only worth 10 points, and if you have time to do them, great. If you don't have time, you don't do them, and you don't really take any real hit on the grade. Those are your three sort of options. And we will now let you vote. Oh, questions before. Yes. Well, I don't want to tell you. Like if so, so you're doing a timestamp. Is that then you get so many points? Yes. So, so I say that when you type a note in, the next time you go to that web page, it says this note was typed on December. Right. That would be worth say two points out of a hundred for the entire site. Because you know if you don't do it, it's not a huge loss. It's not a big bang for the buck, but a good website would do that. So that's what the um, bang for the buck one is. On the other hand, if I think it'll probably take you an hour to do this and it's a 10 hour assignment, then that piece should be a 10 point. Yeah. Uh, as far as this goes, when you say for bang for your buck, there's very specific outcomes to be provided that yes. they give us very specific Yes, yeah. absolutely. No, they are very, in fact, before you vote, sure, I'll show you. Well, I put the assignment in the assignments category, but it was not linked in. So I will do that right after the class. Okay, so let's go through the assignment real quick. So on the role change page, which I gave you an example of last time, uh, if you click on one of these tabs, like Aaron's an admin, and I click the admin tab, she will no longer be an admin. If I click the chair, she will become a chair. If I click the chair again, she won't be a chair. So the ability to change permissions is one of the requirements of the assignment. Number two. Course notes, so at the top of a course, there'll be a box where you can type in a note. So this course has the best learning outcome. So you just type that in and you hit submit. And if you submit it, it saves it and puts the date when it was updated. Um, this approve button is there just to show if you, this is not for the lecturer, this is for the department chair. So the department chair could not edit this but if they approve of whatever your note is, they can click the approve button, and that will show that they have looked over your stuff. So that's an important deal. Mm -hmm. The third part is for learning outcomes. Every learning outcome, you can type a note. For example, this learning outcome needs to be updated and reviewed again. Or, I really like assignment number five. It took a lot of time to create, but it was worth it. So these are the things that you'll have to do. You'll have to be able to tag notes with learning outcomes. You're supposed to tag a note with the course. And you're able to switch on and off the uh, roles for given users inside your system. All of these will use Ajax. Okay, so now to the gold part. So here's the gold part. So two points for putting a date stamp to show the um, date and the, when the note was done. Uh, so that approve button where the chair can click, I approve this note, I've looked over things. So the now imagine I am 
Professor Whitaker and I'm reviewing Jim's course and they've given a note and I say, okay, this all looks good. Chair Whitaker would hit the approve button. And then when, when Jim came back to the site, he would just see a note that says, this was approved by Chair Whitaker. That's what the approved button is. Okay, again, that's where my expectation is that that would be worth three points. So it's gonna take some work to do that. Okay, some of you might not have time to do it, so the idea would be, well, it's only three points, you don't need to do it. Um, instead of a plain text area, you would have a WYSIWYG editor. So instead of having these just generic boxes where you type stuff in, you would put a WYSIWYG editor around there. That requires downloading the WYSIWYG JavaScript library and then maybe, maybe one call to that library. So that's usually pretty straightforward. But again, that's, I would say, for two points. In the learning outcomes, if the notes was edited by the department chair, so it will allow the department chair to edit the notes, then it will be displayed in red. If it was edited by a professor, it will be shown in black. That's where two points. Big stamps on the note, one point. And then, of course, I said add spinners for zero points. So already there's a little bit of gold there. Right? So, okay, so questions. Are you saying that in the gold grading version, that everyone automatically received, it could be 10 out of 10 points? So in the gold version, where I just say, hey, you want to do these things, this is good stuff, I expect you to, you want to be good, you'll just do it. Everyone gets those 10 points, and those in the grading, it just everyone gets those points. That's exactly right. So this is right now what we're seeing the bang through box. This is the bang through box, that's how I currently designed it, where it's 10 points, the very specific stuff, but I think it's going to take a couple of hours to put all those things in. So then the time weighted model would have been like 10 points would be expanded to like. Yes, so like the spinners would be like three points each, and the date stamp would be five points, and the note might be 10 points or something like that. I don't know what to do. But again, the, there's no wow me factors. These are very specific things that I believe are accomplishable and pretty well defined. And of course, we can clarify. Yes. Will these be part of 100 points or will these be an extra thing? No, no, it's all out of 100 points. Yeah. These would either, every, either the sign would be worth 100 and everyone would get 10 for free. That's the gold version. Um, or the current version, you have to earn those 10 points. Or the weighted version, where, hey, this is going to take you a lot of time. You're going to do it anyway, but it should be worth some value. That's the weighted. Yes. If we do select the gold version, these will stay on. They will stay on the assignment, and where it says 210, those will stay there, but in the grading, the TAs will just go and click those buttons and say, you get two points for doing date stamps, even if you didn't do date stamps. So, go ahead, do take, we'll take our five minute break right now. Go ahead and do the clicker questions and buy a break, whatever you need to do. <laughs>
and Skype and talk while you're working. But um, in general, if you plan to pair, I want you to pair right. Uh, it looks like a quarter of the class is already going to sit in the work for half a quarter is going to look for partners. You need to set up your partnership by Wednesday so I know who you're partnering with. So you have two days to find a partner. If not, you need to work alone. Um, and you're not going to work with partners, same rules. You can still talk with your peers, you can debate ideas, but when you write the code, obviously you need to write the code yourself. 
Okay. Uh, so that goes to this. Uh, I created a user roles page on the past comment. So you will need a user's role page for this. If you don't have one and you pair up with somebody who does, great, you're all set, use that version. If you don't, come to my office hours and I will help you get your user roles table up so that you'll have a place to start from. So if you don't already have that, come see me. Yes. So I suppose this is kind of like the department of narrative. Um, if we have a solo assignment later, we have to update our personal code to the version that like PS5 would have brought it to. Um, you either have to update yours or you'll have to just copy, make a copy of whatever you get from PS5. So you both have your own starting place. Okay, and then you go on Brady. So by just a little bit, it looks like people would like to be given the responsibility of just doing this because it's the right thing to do, but the points don't matter. So that's what we'll do. I will, the points will still be on there. It will still be marked like you did this because I'll assume you have done it. But if you don't do it, it'll still be marked that you did it and get points for that. And we'll see how it goes. I was talking with Professor David Johnson and he actually came up with this idea. He suggested, he said, studies have shown that students will actually do this if you tell them. So let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Questions on the assignment? Is it fairly clear from those pictures what I'm expecting? See some nods. Any? So look over the assignment. Um, it's in the assignments group, but I'll also link it to the main modules week um, after class. But read it over and bring questions on when you still. Okay, so. I will walk you through basically what it takes to get notes set up for at least a student in the Kitaso um, University example, which should make doing it for courses fairly straightforward. And then the idea for the course to learning outcome should not be a great leap. So the first thing we have to do is create a student note class. So here I've created one with a student note ID, and the note is just a string. And the note will then be linked to a student such that whenever there is a note, it must have a student that is attached to it. Now, notice this is a one way relationship. Does a student have to have a note? Not necessarily, but if a note is written, it has to be associated with a student. All right, so the student class will have just the student note object. Once we build this and update our migration accordingly, we will then have a link between the student and the student note that we can query using our before queries. Finally, there's one, so we updated our note here. We updated our student. What's the last thing we have to do to put something into our database? Before we seed it, seeding is important. In fact, I will ask that you seed at least one comment into your database for testing purposes. But before you do the migration, you have to do one other step. Yeah, and then check the comment. Remember, our database is defined in code, just like these are defined in code. So absolutely, you have to 
to add to be reset into your database contacts. So here we will have a table that has the student notes. This is what tells the code to build a new data table inside the database. Okay. Yes. What other fields do we have to have those students? Is it are we, do we have to be worried that the student has to be used later in later assignments to expand on that and to name the grade and whatnot? Do we have to think forward in that? Or so the question is, what, what, am I, what did I delete when I put dot, dot, dot up here? And this is from the Contasso University example. So this student class is the student class from the Contasso University. So the thing that's missing is this Contasso University fields. Basically, just why we copy that object from there for the most part with a few few parts in that tutorial. Right, because everyone has done the tutorial now, right? Even not this may feel good, not even you have to <laughs> done it. Yes. Yes, you would add this field here to that. But we don't have to worry about the American students you are in our application in any way. No, no, there are no students in our application. Now this is we're using again, we're using this built-in tutorial code chunk because it stands alone. We're 99% sure it's correct and we can do testing in it to make sure that we understand all the concepts. Once we've done it there, then we can port the code to our application and make modifications as necessary. Okay, so we update our database set, we add our migrations, and then we have to have a place to put this on our student view. So in, I decided in the Contasso example to go into the views for students and on the details page. So when you're viewing details about a student, you'll put the notes on the details page. That seemed like a reasonable place to do it. And so I threw all this code. So let's take a look at what that equates to and then we'll come back and review this code. So we're running. So here we are at the Kentucky University. I go to students. Here's my list of students. I click the details on one. And at the bottom, I just added this div. And I put it in big and blue so we can see it easily. And I put a big textbook where I can type student notes. I'm using a form because forms give me the nice submit button. And when I hit submit, then something will happen that should be good. Let's look at what should be. Okay, so this should be fairly straightforward. We are using we are using a um, div style. Just put a board around it so you can see it. We're using the form. The form is going to call change note when it is. Posted. It's going to use the post methodology, and I'm going to use the text area. Now, one thing just to know, and I know you've put up forms before, but you probably haven't really paid attention. All the elements of a form often will have an ID and a name. Are these the same? Well, in this, my case, the name and the ID are exactly the same. So often you'll see this example where really it's not clear what purpose each of those pieces is doing. What is the ID for in any HTML? It's for knowing exactly where in the document this one piece is, and jQuery will allow me to find this ID and do stuff to it. The name is what is actually magically transformed into data that is sent with the form. So when you give a name note, your code will expect to see a data field called note that contains that data. Uh, here I'm just throwing in the old note on here. By the way, what's going to happen when we do this and we run this code? Why is this bad? As a CS person, if you're not, if you're like the second or third thing down your list of everything that goes wrong is not null exception. You're not doing this right, yes. No exception. What happens if there is no notes associated with the student? Boom. Of course, does not does not happen. So you really cannot just put there. You have to put that in the statement. You have to put that there. Um, other than that, nothing exciting about this view. Anything exciting?
Okay, um, so then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put our JavaScript into our program, and I want you to create separate files for all of your JavaScript. So in the www root JavaScript folder, you will put a note.js file, and in there we will do something like this. So we just to test that jQuery is working, we'll do console.log loaded inside that way we can test that this code is actually looked at. And then this function submit note, this is what we're going to put our code into. So that's the JavaScript part. We also need to change the student controller. So we're going to start with this very simple student controller called change note. And all it's going to do is return success. So if you can get to this point, it will return a message success. Again, we're taking baby steps to make sure that we got all the pieces put together. OK, so we did edit the database and add a note for good students. So let's go look at our database and see it. I don't think I did that yet, so we will check. So in our SQL, we will find our student notes and we will view data. And this is where it'd be nice to have it seeded. We will choose student <coughs> note ID one. Oh, we're just going to fill it in. Note, good student work. And then we'll give a student ID. And so now student one has a note called good student. And if everything was working, Correctly, if I load student one, it will say good student work inside the message. So the old message is put into the box. So there we go, we tested it out, it worked. Um, let's look at this magic inspect. So I'm going to go to the inspect, I'm going to go to networking, I'm going to delete all of the networking previous things, we can see all these like site CSS and jQuery and Bootstrap. We don't care about any of that stuff, so we're going to clear this. We're going to click Preserve Log. And the reason we click Preserve Log is anytime you load a new page, it's going to get rid of all the old stuff. So sometimes you accidentally load a new page and you lose all of your data, so Preserve Log is good. If we're using Ajax correctly, we don't have to preserve the log because we're not loading a new page. We've got the same page. Okay, so, um, and then we hit submit. Oops, I meant to say, let's let that go. We're looking at the network. And so, one request was made. The request was called change note. Status 200 actually said it was okay. Here is, you know, so 246 bytes, it took 56 milliseconds. It's sort of interesting, you can see the timing. And all this stuff is not interesting to you until you're writing a real program where things get delayed and then you have to come and look and see where did things fall out? Did you have problems with your security layer? Did you have problems waiting for the request to be made? Did you have problems downloading the content? Again, not necessary for us at this point, but interesting to know about. What is interesting is if we click on the note, we will see the headers that work with our notes. So, here is the request location. It was a student's change note. It was a post. It had a 200 OK on return. The request headers, these are perhaps more interesting because they say that um, we are expecting JSON. And we'll talk about that in a little bit and how much content, how long the JSON was. And then at the very bottom, we can see the actual data that was sent. Jim is a student was sent. And note ID one was sent. Okay, so where did all this stuff come from? Let's go look. So when I was running this on my computer, my computer crashed earlier today. So then I had to download the example code, which is already working, which is unfortunate because we want to build the example code. I know it's unfortunate because it's working. 
Um, but let's go here and get rid of all that stuff and just return. Okay, so we're not going to do anything. We're just going to use the standard submit that our form does. And let's go back to our website, reload. There, populated with my notes. I can change my notes to hello, and I can submit. And boom, you're going to see this a lot. It sent the note out, and it got a response. The response was success. And here's the note, and here's the ID. So the server sent this information back. But why did my web page, what, what happened to my web page? My web page is the note. So it's when that note came back with success status, it assumed, oh, I guess they, that's a web page. It didn't know any better. It reloaded it into a web page and showed it to you. So let me show you the key piece that I got rid of to make that work. So this prevent default. The default method of any submission is to reload the results in a new web page. In Ajax, we do not want to reload in a new web page. We want to put it right there. So e.preventDefault must be called inside of our Ajax call in order to prevent that from happening. Okay? If you don't, all of that response will find itself on a new web page and it'll be one of the next ones to call. Okay, it looks like we are out of time at this point. We will continue running through this and showing different ways to make it work and not work and all those things.